This podcast contains murder and mayhem, guts and gore, adult language, and sexual content. Exactly what you came here for. All the listener discretion is advised. (laughs) Grab your Ouija board, light the candles, and grab your jar of human teeth because you and I are going to escape for a bit. Hide your kids, hide your husbands, hide your wives. You don't need them. This is you time. Also, hide your dads because hello, it's me. Pour yourself a cocktail or a glass of dark Welcome to the Mistress of the Macabre podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Tiara. It is fucking hot in LA. I'm sure it's fucking hot wherever you are as well. And I turned my AC off for this shit, so let's get right into it. Natalie Drissel was a bright and vibrant young woman. She was originally from Wildwood, Missouri, and had enrolled in college in West Palm Beach, Florida, where she was majoring in communications. During the summer of 2003, when Natalie was 20 years old, she had taken a job working at a Christian summer camp called the Horn Creek Conference Center in Westcliff, Colorado. It was here that she met her boyfriend. His name was not given in any article I could find, not in any of my sources, so we will just call him The Boyfriend. So she met him while she was working summers at the camp, and he worked at the camp full-time. In November of 2003, Natalie decided to take a trip to visit her boyfriend over Thanksgiving and spend the holiday in the beautiful, snowy Colorado landscape. Natalie had been at the conference center since Tuesday, November 25th, when she flew in from West Palm Beach to the Colorado Springs Airport, where her boyfriend picked her up. They decided to each stay in separate guest cabins at the camp, Given the religious nature of the place, no sin here. Also, they were very chaste, polite, young Christian people, so they didn't want any El Scandalo. The couple spent Thanksgiving Day together, taking walks around the area and enjoying the scenery. I want to know what they ate for Thanksgiving dinner. I want to know where they went. Did they cook? Did they go to a friend's house? Did they go to a restaurant? What did they have? I need to know. However, I could not find a single thing about what they ate for dinner. Uh, unfortunately, you know a bitch wants to know about the food. The couple had a magical Thanksgiving together. According to her boyfriend, everything was beautiful and perfect. And that's the end of the story. This young Christian sweet couple had a great Thanksgiving and got married and had kids and ran away together. And had lots of really, really great sex. I'm just kidding. Obviously, we wouldn't be covering this if that was the case. So after a day of activities together, Natalie's boyfriend dropped her off back at her cabin shortly after midnight so that she could get some rest. On the morning after Thanksgiving, Natalie's boyfriend came back to her cabin around 8.30 in the morning only to find that she was missing. She was not in the cabin. After some searching around the premises, he noticed bare footprints in the snow leading away from the cabin. He followed the footprints to a forested location approximately 200 yards from the conference building of the camp, so the main building. It was there that he found her nude body with only one set of footprints. With only one set of footprints. Am I saying that weird? (laughs) With only one set of footprints leading to her corpse and he found her body at 8 50 a.m so what would cause a young woman to run barefoot and naked through the snow and woods alone and in the middle of the night what terrified her so much that this was her only course of action the single set of prints that had led them to natalie's body meant that she had not been pursued by anyone in the moments before her death or by an animal of some sort. There were no other footprints. The sheriff of Custer County noted that it appeared Natalie had wandered aimlessly for some time, and he called her steps erratic, as if she'd been wandering through the area in a daze before she collapsed. It was also judged that, given the state of rigor mortis she was in, that she had actually died very soon after being dropped off back at the cabin, maybe only 15 to 20 minutes after her boyfriend had departed around 12.30 a.m. An autopsy was performed on Natalie by the El Paso County Coroner on November 30th. Coroner noticed she was overall in a healthy state physically, 
given that there were pine needles in her hair with dirt and abrasions on her face and shoulder, coupled with the chaotic patterning of her footsteps, it appeared that Natalie's injuries were consistent with someone running through a dense forested area and crashing into trees. Evidence of such injuries included linear scratches on her forehead, cheeks, neck, chest, abdomen, and legs, small contusions just above the trachea on her right cheek and to the right of her chin, purple contusions on her left forearm, hand, and wrist. Other than superficial injuries, there were no internal injuries to her head or neck, no evidence of sexual assault, and no drugs or alcohol in her system. I saw it noted that she had an elevated level of glucose in her urine. I looked into that. That can be an indication of pregnancy, which sparked some rumors online, but Natalie was definitely not pregnant. Remember, they did an autopsy on her body. She was absolutely not pregnant. Uh, It could also indicate hyperglycemia. The high blood glucose levels, also known as hyperglycemia, may be a sign of diabetes, a disorder that can cause heart disease, blindness, kidney failure, and other complications. So what exactly happened that cold Thanksgiving night? Well, the results of the autopsy that was done by the El Paso County coroner created more questions than answers. The coroner declared Natalie's death to have been caused by, quote, excited delirium, end quote. Excited delirium is a very controversial and vague diagnosis, and it is not recognized by many in the medical community, especially back in 2003. It's described as a combination of psychomotor agitation, delirium, and sweating. It is also described as agitated or excited delirium is an acute confusional state marked by intense paranoia, hallucinations, and violence towards objects and people. The American College of Emergency Physicians wrote a report in 2009 that attempted to legitimize a previously poorly defined serious medical scenario that was familiar to law enforcement, emergency medical services, and emergency physicians. Excited Delirium Syndrome, or EXDS, In addition, it supported the aggressive and potentially life-saving use of chemical sedation. It was the consensus of the task force that EXDS is a unique syndrome that may be identified by the presence of a distinctive group of clinical and behavioral characteristics that can be recognized in the pre-mortem state. EXDS, though potentially fatal, may be amenable to early therapeutic intervention in some cases. The task force defined the existence of excited delirium as a true disease entity, described the signs, symptoms, and risk for death, and reviewed current and emerging methods of control and treatment. Before this report, agitated delirium and various poorly defined related terms were used to describe a serious form of agitated delirium that could culminate in death. Such deaths were often high-profile news events that inexplicably occurred in seemingly healthy young males and often involved interactions with seriously deranged and violent individuals and law enforcement officers. The majority of affected individuals are young males. Features of EXDS include uncontrolled aggression and agitation, tremendous pain tolerance, sweating, tactile hyperthermia, pacing, grunting, noncompliance with police officers, unusual and untiring strength, being inappropriately clothed, extreme paranoia, and having an attraction to mirror or glass. Individuals are unable to engage in rational discussion or understand or de-escalate their abnormal, aggressive, violent, and threatening behavior. A common fatal scenario is characterized by a period of extreme delirium, increasing agitation, and inability to reason or comply with efforts to control their agitated state, followed by a struggle with law enforcement that involves vigorous physical restraint, i.e. chokeholds, hog tying, prone positioning, knee to throat, and noxious chemicals. The exact cause of death in EXDS cannot be identified at autopsy. Death may be related to underlying but unknown pathology, such as cardiomyopathy, conduction abnormalities, and metabolic disturbances. Lack of complete prior medical information, especially underlying cardiac abnormalities, hampers ascertainment of the actual cause of death when only the autopsy results are interpreted. The coroner listed six main factors that caused him to reach such a decision in the autopsy of Natalie. The first and main point being that she had been found completely naked, having not been obviously pursued by anyone. There were also no internal injuries at all, 
and so no obvious way of telling how she died. There was also a complete lack of narcotics in her system, so there was no way a drug could be to blame for the erratic state that she was in that evening. There is also the possibility that, given she was a recent arrival to a relatively high altitude from sea level Florida, that a lack of oxygen in her brain could be to blame for her delirium. I call bullshit on that. Sorry, coroner. But she worked summers at the camp. She spent time in Colorado. She was used to the elevation. I don't think that that factors in. On top of all of this, there was an elevated amount of glucose in her urine, so it seems to be possible that a hyperglycemic state could be to blame for her behavior. While the autopsy did not determine the manner of death, the death certificate will list her cause of death as cardiac arrhythmia due to metabolic circumstances. The pathologist working on the case said that 1-2% to of people who die do so because of unusual circumstances. In essence, a combination of forces changes the body chemistry and stops the heart. Sheriff Jeff Job said they've ruled out anything criminal. It's just really, really weird but we're still hoping to find out something more conclusive. Lee Royball, officer in charge of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, also commented on the unusual nature of Natalie's death, saying that it's, quote, the strangest thing you've ever seen, end quote. Ted Wiggin, Custer County Undersheriff, stated, she died of natural causes in sort of an unnatural way. So it's excited delirium seems to be a non-answer answer. It's almost a professional way of saying it's just one of those crazy things that happens. We don't know how or why, which must be so hard for her family to have basically zero insight to what happened and how their daughter died. Naturally, people wanted a concrete explanation of what exactly happened to Natalie. Hi, it's me. I'm people. Speculation formed by the public that her boyfriend, the last person to see her alive, was involved somehow, but Natalie's family does not believe her boyfriend had anything to do with it. Also, given the lack of any internal or major external injuries, this seems unlikely. There's another unfounded rumor going around on the internet that Natalie had an eating disorder which had weakened her heart and caused her death. I'm not going to go into that, bullshit I think it's just she's gone and she can't defend herself and I don't think we should be putting that out there if it's unsubstantiated nor does it explain the whole running naked through the forest part that doesn't explain any of that Natalie had absolutely no history of mental illness no history of drug use and was in perfect health right up until her death that Thanksgiving night but all of a sudden she had some sort of psychotic break for no reason at all Her behavior had been completely normal that day, her entire life, but that whole day leading up to the time her boyfriend dropped her off 15 to 20 minutes before her death. So if she was wandering in the forest erratically for, let's say, 5 to 15 minutes, that means that whatever happened to make her run out of the cabin happened five minutes or so after her boyfriend left. And said incident did not take long to occur. The incident itself couldn't have taken long because there's just not enough time. And just minutes after that, she dropped dead. Did Natalie encounter someone or something in or around the cabin that night? A person or a wild animal that posed such a terrifying threat that she abandoned all reason and took off into the woods naked. Also, I mean, I want to point out, Natalie was definitely a modest girl, modest enough to get a separate cabin from her boyfriend at the camp, and modest enough to work at a Christian camp. I find it hard to believe she'd be comfortable running around outside without clothes on unless that was her absolute only option. As some of you may know, I'm not a modest person and I would never run outside my house naked unless that was my only option. I would be mortified. I can't even imagine how mortified she would be. It would be like a hundredfold of what I would feel. I do feel like something terrified her that night panicked her, and maybe even scared her to death. In this case, the idea of hypothermia does come to mind. It was the first thing I thought of. The mental and physical reactions are slightly similar, and paradoxical undressing comes to mind as a potential reason why she would remove all of her clothes. However, the coroner ruled out hypothermia, with Sheriff Fred Job confirming, saying, We have ruled out hypothermia because she was not in a position consistent with freezing to death. There's also the fact that Natalie was used to cold winters. She grew up in Missouri, and Missouri experiences freezing temperatures every year. In the winter, there's an average of about 110 days with temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The majority of snow falls over December, January, and February in Missouri, with winter averages of about 18 to 24 inches of snow. She was used to snowy weather. She was used to the elevation and weather in Colorado. Also, she would have only had 5 to 10 minutes after being dropped off to even have hypothermia set in before her time of death, which isn't enough time. It's just not. The time in this case doesn't add up. It just, it doesn't make any sense. Everything happens so quickly, like too quickly almost. Will we ever know what exactly happened to Natalie that night? I really hope so. It's maddening. It's really sad. I feel terrible for her family and friends to be left without her and also to be left with so many questions. That was my sister, mother, daughter, friend. I would lose my mind. I would need to know what happened. And I still need to know what happened. It's just so hard to give in and say that some things are a mystery and we're never going to know. I feel like we should be able to solve everything with science and logic, but sometimes we just don't get what we want and the questions remain to drive us crazy. Let me know if you have any theories or thoughts or you come across any online, send them to me. Really, really drives me crazy. She was perfectly healthy and there's also no explanation of how or why she died. It just doesn't seem fair. I feel terrible for her family, but yeah, if you if you come across anything I didn't find, email me, mistress of the macabre podcast at gmail.com. I want to know everything. Uh, thanks for tuning in to a minor episode, and I will see you soon for a nice fat chat episode, which you're either going to love or hate, but hopefully love. Okay, take care. Bye. Full source notes are available at mistressofthemacabrepodcast.com as well as all photos pertaining to each episode. Follow along on Instagram for all the insane and gory photos that accompany each episode at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast. Please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show grow and I will love you forever. And please tell a friend if you even have any. If you have topic ideas, questions, comments, animal facts, or unsettling stories you'd like to share, email me at mistressofthemacabrepodcast at gmail.com. Please support the show by joining Patreon. Bonus content is available, such as Mistress of the Macabre Movies, where I tell you my favorite horror movies, as well as some other things coming down the pipeline. I'm just one young teenage girl writing, researching, producing, editing, and recording the show. Your support goes a long way. Bye!